Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Allow me to warmly welcome you to today's seminar session, the sixth of the seminar series titled Curriculum Studies in Canada. My name is Ying Ma, postdoctorate fellow in UBC and coordinator for this seminar series. I'm very happy to chair today's meeting. Each seminar will be approximately one hour uh, with speakers allowed around 40 minutes to give their presentations, followed by a short Q&A segment. With the permission of each speaker, we will be recording each session and they will become available on both of our website, curriculumstudiesincanada.ca and our YouTube channel. Today, we're very happy to have Dr. Jackie Seidel from University of Calgary to give us a talk. And now, Leslie will briefly introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Kai, uh, Dr. Seidel, and then um, Dr. Seidel will give us the talk uh, today. Welcome. Thank you very much, Kujima. Um, Oki, Tanse, Leslie Nitsigatu, Aochinia Michelle First Nation, Megwatz Nibiginoto Squanik. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Leslie. I'm a member of Michelle First Nation in Treaty 6 territory, but I am also currently a graduate student at the University of Calgary. Uh, I first came to know Jackie during my master's degree, and I am lucky enough now to say that she is both a dear friend and my PhD supervisor. I don't need to tell all of you listening today, but coming into your graduate work can be a very daunting experience. You're never sure how you fit or where you fit or generally what you're supposed to be doing. So I am incredibly grateful to Jackie. She has shown me and countless others what is possible in academia. She has shown me that it's possible to be kind and humble. It's possible to be brilliant and thoughtful. It's possible to be honest and generous. And I am in awe of her. Jackie's work is full of beauty and love. Every student who has ever been around her, whether it is a junior high student, an undergrad student, or a graduate student, has been touched by her kindness, her generosity, and her love. You only need to read one of her articles or listen to her speak to see how much she loves both education and students. She somehow manages to highlight educational issues and concerns with schooling, with society, all while allowing educators to feel confident and inspired. That balance alone speaks to her incredible integrity. And so I'm truly honored today to be able to introduce Nito Tem, my friend, Dr. Jackie Seidel. Thank you, Leslie, and welcome. Everybody, I'm glad to be here with you today in these important times, and thank you for coming. I'm sharing these thoughts with you today from Treaty 7 territory in the spirit of reconciliation and the sincere desire to move forward together in a good way. And I acknowledge that I'm here presenting and living as a settler and the child of immigrants on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tutina and the Stony Nakoda Nations and Métis Nation Region 3. And I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that what is happening politically here in Alberta, including with education and curriculum is not in the spirit of reconciliation. And so I feel deeply committed to work hard to speak the truth and to document what is happening. And I hope this presentation manages to do this uh, a little bit. Since the election of the United Conservative Party government in Alberta in the spring of 2019, teachers here have faced an increasingly hostile teaching situation, particularly when they address topics such as climate crisis, oil industry issues, or Indigenous settler reconciliation. The government has repeatedly claimed that they will get politics and ideology out of the curriculum. They are both overtly and covertly fostering mistrust towards schools and teachers on social media and in the legislature. So for this presentation, I said a long time ago, like a year ago maybe, that I was going to consider life-serving pedagogical and curriculum responses to what it means to teach in these conditions and time. 
But uh, here in Alberta, we're still in the moment of very intensely experiencing and witnessing it. And so my talk today focuses more on the witnessing part of what is happening and attempting to understand it. And part of my approach to witnessing and documenting this has been engaging in an arts-based process of composing a book of found poetry uh, in the words mostly of Premier Jason Kenney, but also the other UCP MLAs and trying to capture the S uh, yeah, trying to capture the essence of what's going on. And so I'm going to start by sharing three of these found poems because I think they give a strong general sense of the political background and context of what's coming in my presentation. So poem number one is uh, Jason Nixon, who's the UCP MLA for Rimby Rocky Mountain House Sundry. And this is him introducing a motion in the Alberta legislature on February 26, 2020. The title is Bill 1, the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act. Be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly unequivocally denounce the illegal blockading of Canada's core infrastructure, including railways, pipelines, ports, and roadways, and call for the law to be enforced without delay. So on the day before Jason Nixon introduced this motion that I just shared, Premier Jason Kenney performed a very long emotional rant about half an hour long uh, in the legislature. And this event was what started my poetry project. He was presenting his argument for why Bill 1, what many now refer to as the anti-protest law, should be brought into law. And Jason Kenney has the habit of dismissing people that he doesn't like or doesn't agree with by calling them names. So this poem is his long rant with all of the content removed and only the name calling remaining. It's called My Enemies, a poem by Alberta Premier and UCP leader Jason Kenney. Radicals, urban green left zealots, anarchists, the misguided young folk Mohawk folk around Belleville who are not aware of the facts. Militants, left loony activists, Extinction Rebellion, the Europeans who donate to the campaign to landlock our energy, the Toronto Star, and extremist elements like climate justice, the CBC, those with extremist political views, the NDP, the fashionable political views of the loony left in downtown Toronto or Vancouver, extremist agendas, the, job, the law breaking, job killing activity that is damaging the dream of reconciliation, radicals. And poem number three, I'm just gonna read a short excerpt. It's a bit long, but it's a guest poem by UCP MLA Garth Roswell, who is the MLA for Vermilion Lloyd Minster Wainwright. And uh, these are the exact words of a speech that he gave in the legislature on October 28th, 2020, a few weeks ago. And the title of this poem is Extremist Agitators and Malcontents. So he starts it off, I'm going to miss a few stanzas here with uh, a bit of a climate denial speech. And then I'll share two stanzas here. What has become more and more apparent is that there has been an attempt by extremist agitators and malcontents who stand against capitalism and free markets to undermine our great energy industry with fallacious claims. Access to fossil fuel derived energy has been one of, if not the greatest thing that has ever happened to the human race. We need to expand the use of fossil fuels, not restrict them. I am happy that Alberta's government has a premier who stands up relentlessly for our oil and gas industry. Alberta's government knows that our energy industry means more than short term jobs. It is the future. That UCP MLAs on the floor responded to this with hear, hear. So while I was researching MLA Roswell's background, I came across a pre election article where he was answering his local Vermilion newspaper's questions about the election platform. And to the question of what would he focus on if he were elected, he directly cited their campaign slogan, jobs, economy, pipelines. And to the question about what he would do about education, he answered very briefly from their platform, quote, getting ideological fads and politics out of our classrooms and getting back to the basics of literacy and math. 
Now, all of us have heard this kind of rhetoric before. It's been well documented historically in curriculum studies literature for over 100 years. And so my presentation is not so much about analyzing that, but sharing with you how this particular vision of education is playing itself out in Alberta right now. In her 2016 edited book, First World Petropolitics, Lori Adkin from the University of Alberta writes, quote, Alberta provides a case study of a first world petro state governed politically by neoliberal ideologues for more than two decades, end quote. And in the introduction to an edited 2017 collection, the editors of the book Petrocultures comment on how oil is hidden in plain sight. And they write, quote, the importance of fossil fuels in defining modernity has stood in inverse relationship to their presence in our cultural and social imaginaries, end quote. So what does this mean? Consider the ways that oil, fossil fuel, is ubiquitous and everywhere. It's so much part of our identity that it is nearly invisible to us and out of our consciousness most of the time. It provides our energy, our transportation, and it is in and on our bodies. It is our clothes, plastics, cosmetics, electronic devices, and furniture. It has facilitated mass mobility of humans locally and globally, as well as the movement of products and accompanied mass consumption. It has enabled industrialized monoculture agriculture and the use of uh, petroleum derived fertilizers. It's facilitated and provoked terrible wars that have killed, harmed and displaced uncountable numbers of humans. The climate and weather of the planet have been forever altered in a way that are already making some places unlivable. So oil literally and figuratively fuels our lives while also now portending an existential and catastrophic threat to life. These issues are related to education and curriculum. The hard to change culture of mass compulsory education globally was birthed in the early years of the industrial age, is fueled by oil and coal. The question of what place fossil fuels play in curriculum and pedagogy is an important one. And now, as a massive culture, energy, and economic shift is incur occurring, likely very rapidly, I wonder what might be the curriculum and pedagogies that accompany that, and what are the ones that are appropriate for this time. So we're going to take a dive in here now with a slideshow into what is happening in Alberta schools curriculum and teachers with the political situation here. And the slideshow has quite a few slides and it's not really important that you're able to see all the details. I'm going to go through some of them quite quickly and linger on a few others. And as a whole, I hope they will provide a sense of the current educational landscape and mood here in Alberta. So Will somebody let me know if this isn't showing up properly? Okay. So as soon as they took office, the UCP government started cutting budgets for anything related to the public sector, including universities, schools, and healthcare. And this is a photo of me on February 29th, 2020, standing with the statues of the famous five after a massive public sector worker rally in March in Calgary. This was the largest protest I've ever witnessed here, and similar ones were held across the province. I'm holding a sign that says radical activists in the classroom and the meaning of this will become clear as we move through this presentation. So shortly after taking office, the government took several steps along with immediately canceling Alberta's carbon tax. They instituted what they called a public inquiry into anti-Alberta anti energy campaigns. So this is the first page of the website about that. Steve Allen, a Calgary forensic and restructuring accountant, was given $2.5 million in July 2019 to conduct this inquiry. 
The report was due in July 2020. He requested an extension and another million dollars. He was given the extension and the money until October 2020. At that time, he requested an additional extension, which was granted until <clears throat> January 30th, 2021. Excuse me. So on that day, will Steve Allen present evidence of a quote, well-funded boring campaign that has defamed Alberta's energy industry and sought to landlock our oil, end quote. Remember at the same time during this first year, especially in 2019 and early 2020, numerous protest movements were arising across Canada, particularly indigenous led ones and also the youth climate strikes. So exactly a year ago today, uh, the Canadian Energy Centre was locked, uh, launched and in the beginning, the government was calling this the war room, the energy war room. And so here we are today on its one year anniversary. And the purpose of this was to promote and tell a positive story of Alberta's energy industry to the rest of the world at a cost of $30 million per year of public tax dollars. And as you know, from the poems that I started with, the government passed actually in June, uh, Bill 1, the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act. And it's very unlikely that this act will stand up to a charter challenge in the Canadian courts, uh, but there are things at risk here, uh, like a threat to Indigenous people's sovereignty, and really its intent is to cause fear and discourage protest. And a violation of this comes with a first offense $10,000 fine, 25,000 for subsequent offenses and a possible prison time of up to six months. So if we go back a year, uh, this article appeared, these are two screenshots uh, on the Canadian Energy Centre website. And you can see this looks pretty different than the one that I shared before. And you can actually also see, I didn't notice this until today, that this article was posted on December 10th. So probably before uh, the website was even launched. And this was one of the first articles to appear there on the website and it's not there anymore uh, a lot of them have been removed and on the right side is the headline is alberta father is irked by a group charity group it calls is nonprofit that targets fossil fuel industry and he's upset that an environmental group was visiting his son's school and presenting about climate change and i think it's important to note here that one of the first pieces posted on the energy center website is about climate change education in schools and how parents should be angry about that. There were several articles like this on the website in the early days. So this is Stephen Lee, who was the subject and topic of uh, that article on that website. And Stephen was the founder and now former, and the former executive director of Canadian nonprofit Foundation for Environmental Stewardship. And he now leads the United Nations major group for children and youth in New York City. So part of their project was the 3% project, which traveled last year across all of Canada, including the North, to visit schools and talk with students about climate change. And while this went quite well in the rest of Canada, it didn't go at all well in Alberta. Uh, this one on the screenshot on the left is one of the many, many articles that appeared about this organization and their visits to schools here in Alberta. And at the beginning of the UCP time in office, I started a habit of donating to any organization that was singled out by them as an enemy. And so I went ahead and made a donation to the Foundation for Environmental Stewardship and sent an email to them explaining why. And then when Steve was in Calgary, he came and had a visit with me in my office at the university. And the stories he told me about his experiences in Alberta were beyond horrifying. In March, the Foundation for Environmental Stewardship released a report documenting their school projects. And the report documents a large amount of hate messages received by Stephen Lee. These are just a small sample and not the worst of them. And uh, pay attention here to the final one. You are a bunch of treasonous cunts. You should be jailed along with the biggest cunt, Greta. Uh, this is a racist meme that was shared on social media after Stephen Lee visited Alberta schools and documented in the program report. In her brilliant article, uh, 2018, called Petromasculinity, Fossil Fuels and Authoritarian Desire, 
Kara Daggett, although she is writing about the USA and Donald Trump, also per perfectly describes the political situation of Alberta. And she writes of the rise of authoritarian movements in the West that are characterized by a combination of what she calls, quote, climate denial, racism, and misogyny, end quote. She describes petrol masculinity as a concept that appreciates the role of fossil fuel systems in buttressing white patriarchal rule. And all over the planet, young people have been marching out of school in the Fridays for Future Climate Strikes inspired by Greta Thunberg. They've been networking across the world. I've been following this closely since the beginning. And online, they've been teaching each other about citizenship, about civil disobedience, collectively calling for different kinds of futures and begging for a new kind of curriculum that meets their needs in this time and for the future that faces them as well as expressing their sincere desire for a world with more justice and peace for all people and all creatures. On the left here is a photo of a pre-service teacher holding the sign, your teachers support you, who is in my social studies classes. A group of us went to a few of these strikes to witness what was happening and to talk with the young people. On the screen uh, on the right side is a screen capture of a global news piece that shows again the sign rising up above the crowd. Every time this pre-service teacher saw a media camera that day, she moved and put her body and sign directly in their view. And images of her and her sign were in nearly every media story about this event. And this message that she is giving here and what she was doing really matters because there were essentially no classroom teachers there and actually almost no parents or adults at all. Um, it was an event with hundreds of young people, mostly middle school age. So this is the Calgary Board of Education's response that was shared with me by a teacher. Um, and they received a letter that instructed them that they were aware of the climate strike, but it's not a CBE, CBE event, so not promoting it. It's a regular school day with students expected to be in class unless they are excused by their parent. But even if they were excused by their parent and they did leave, uh, they will be marked as unexcused absences. And also teachers were instructed that school staff should be neutral and not promote or encourage student participation. Teachers were also instructed to record the exact number of minutes that students missed. In contrast, uh, I got this from the Facebook page of the Fridays for Future Children in the Philippines. So Philippine schools were sent a letter from the government of the Philippines. It was sent to all the different schools. So I pulled out a little bubble here so we could read it better, but it, the subject is the call for climate action for climate week in September, 2019. And the first paragraph of this letter reads, moved by the climate realities faced by the Philippines and inspired by the global youth action, young Filipinos nationwide will take part in the global climate strike a movement of young people to call for governments and private sector in prioritizing climate justice. Uh, in the rest of the letter, the schools were instructed to excuse students to join the strikes. Schools were encouraged to conduct climate education and all kinds of action activities during this week. They encouraged the Youth for Environment student leaders to lead the actions. Students were invited to post on social media and use the hashtag department ed climate action and schools were invited to submit one minute video documentaries to the government of what they did during this week. Uh, on November 29th, 2019, the government of the Philippines sent a similar letter to schools stating this memorandum stands for all succeeding climate strikes. Back to Calgary, uh, here we are back on September 20th, 2019. And for those of you not familiar with Calgary on the right hand side, you can see uh, the glass building there is City Hall, and on the left-hand image, this is uh, Stephen Avenue, and in between is McLeod Trail, a one-way street with four lanes of traffic. And at one point during the strike, the children spontaneously started going back and forth across this street, and so you can see them standing on two sides of the street here waiting for the lights to turn. Here's a picture of the mood of that day, which was extremely moving. You can see how young many of these children are and the absence of adults at this strike. And that was really something to experience and witness for us. 
and uh, to talk with them. And because uh, of the mood here, they really did know that they were participating in practicing civil disobedience. So contrast this image with the curriculum that the government thinks that these children deserve. And the largest climate strike in the world during this week was actually in Canada, in Montreal, with about half a million people in attendance. A few weeks later, Greta Thunberg showed up in Edmonton uh, on October 18th, and there was a very large climate strike that day with about 10,000 people, which is a, a huge uh, protest. In Alberta, showed up at the Alberta Legislature, and the UCP party hung pro-oil signs in their windows and watched from in the Legislature building while this crowd was outside. In February, of 2020 this year, uh, there was a decal sticker handed out by workers on an Excite Energy Services job site in central Alberta. And this image is covered up here. I chose to use the one from the Huffington Post who have obscured the image on their website. And the image is a naked uh, image of a girl from behind with someone's hands pulling on her braids. Greta is written across her back and the Excite company logo is posted across the bottom. This sticker is an overt display of the toxic petrol masculinity and the violence and danger it presents to women and children as well as to the planet. Excite apologized a week later with a letter on their website. And I'll cite again Kara Daggett who wrote the article I cited earlier and she talks about the danger uh, of the convergence of what she thinks is happening, quote, between climate change, a threatened fossil fuel system, and increasingly fragile Western hyper-masculinity. Greta responds in her typical, very classy way with a tweet. They are starting to get more and more desperate. This shows that we are winning. So I'm gonna just flip through a couple of these slides quite quickly, but this is a, a fundraising email from Angela Pitt. She's the MLA for, East, for Airdrie East. And the title, the subject of it is, we're putting an end to discovery learning. And so we see these words coming out here in the pop-out boxes, uh, stopping the ideological NDP curriculum review. We're putting an end to tired fads of constructivism, more commonly known as discovery learning. Um, our kids need not learn the basics, not lessons on how to protest, how to protest from ideological activists parading as teachers and a social studies course that teaches Canadian and global history objectively and without political bias. Oh, also you could, uh, I think you can see my mouse, there's a blue line in the middle. So if you'd like to donate uh, to this cause, you're welcome to do that. And one goal in mind here with the curriculum, our kids will have the skills they need when they graduate from high school. So this is from a website uh, from a group called Rally for Resources and their website no longer exists. They've moved all to social media and they have about 20,000 followers now. And at the moment, most of the posts seem to be active COVID denial, anti-masking and anti-vaccine. But they put this survey up on their website around that same time and you could answer these questions. Schools are no place for radical activists. Do you agree? Yes, I want radical activists out of our school or no, I want radical activists teaching in schools. This is a tweet by Adriana Lagrange and retweeted by Matt Wolf, who is uh, the issues manager for the Premier of Alberta. And she's sharing here, it's difficult to read, but she's sharing a test question that a parent shared with their MLA and that MLA shared with her. And it's a question that's very typical of the kind of questions in high school on social studies exams. It's an interpretive question about the oil sands and somebody's making a comment about protecting the ecosystems. And the question wants to know what does the author of the above quote think? Um, so quite a reasonable kind of test question that students would get to interpret something that they're reading in the news. But uh, this got shared many, many times and she added to the bottom here, or her staff did, keep politics out of our classrooms. 
So then when I was searching for some things on this a few months ago, I came up with this web search and this no longer comes up, which is interesting and probably a topic for another conversation. But uh, these things were there on the, on the web and when you click them, now there's nothing. And at that time that I was looking for them again, I knew they were there and there was nothing here. So all the posts that had previously been on the UCP website had been cleaned off of it and all that was left when I looked is the MLA directly. However, as they say, I kept a receipt. And so uh, at the time that this was posted last January, so remember this is when Steve was being attacked uh, for his project in schools. The Greta stickers came out um, with the Central Alberta Energy Company and the UCP Government Caucus posted this on their website. Radical activists in the classroom, they had lots of advertising on their social media about it and there was a document that you could click on and download, which I did at that time. And so this document was from Layla Goodridge, who is the MLA for Fort Mac, Lac La Biche, on January 29th. And again, it's bringing up Extinction Rebellion, uh, coming into schools, and there's no evidence that this is happening. Uh, there was one time that somebody who was, I think, obliquely involved with Extinction Rebellion did a presentation in Edmonton at City Hall School. And so all of these are referring to, as far as I can tell, that one incident. And so here she repeats again uh, the words of the uh, Canadian Energy Centre and also of the Anti-Albertan Inquiry. Those who have targeted Alberta's energy industry with this campaign of lies do so with one goal in mind, to landlock our resources and shut down our energy sector and the hundreds of thousands of jobs that it supports and parents, families, and energy workers deserve to know why radical activists are in the classrooms. So sure enough, a couple days later, a petition appears on the UCP caucus website. And the title of the petition is Keep Extinction Rebellion Out of Our Classrooms. And if we look back at the dates here, this is actually gearing up to the introduction of uh, Bill 1 in the legislature. So one of the quotes from the middle of this is, we've made it clear there's no room in our classrooms for radical activists like these. And at the bottom, you could fill in all your details. You had to put at least one phone number. There's a note there saying you must put your phone number and then you click to sign the petition and it took you to a fundraising page. So Timothy Snyder in his book on tyranny, 20 lessons from the 20th century warns us to listen for dangerous words. And the Jason Kinney poem that I started with at the beginning was full of these dangerous words and we can see them coming up here being repeated and amplified in the legislature, in and by the media and on social media, radical, extremist, ideolo ideological and others repeated over and over often in association with schools and schooling uh, like a clever marketing trick. So this is Colin Atchison, the press secretary to Minister Adriana Lagrange, and here he tweeted a photoshopped image of a fake medicine hat news article. And uh, so his statement in here is that the NDP are angry that Alberta schools will focus on reading, writing, and arithmetic. This is on August 6th, and that curriculum will focus on basics and keep out political bias. Uh, one of the people reading this put a comment wondering if uh, we were also teaching children about doctoring documents, plagiarizing, copyright laws, and the Medicine Hat News responded, it was not obtained. They also got the date wrong. They used an old logo. logo. They also made up the headline. So this tweet no longer exists and uh, he is no longer the uh, press secretary as of a couple of weeks ago. This is David Staples, a journalist with the Edmonton Journal. And anybody that comments on his Twitter account uh, gets blocked pretty much immediately. So there's a famous hashtag blocked by Staples that people use because most people will post a screenshot of what he says because most people, um, if they're sharing it and they can see it, they know a lot of people can't. So the UCP are now in the middle of a curriculum review and I left this slide blank because we're not really sure what is happening with it. In their election platform, they promised they would get rid of the NDP curriculum, that's what they called it, even though the curriculum revisions that were happening um, had been underway for many years, even prior to the NDP becoming the government. And the K-4 draft for all subjects had been up on Alberta Education's website for about a year 
for 2018 and 19, and it was scheduled to be implemented as a draft in the fall of 2019. So many of us at the university were already using these documents in our undergrad classes as it seemed certain that this would be the curriculum that they would be using when students began their teaching careers. Last week, the framework document for the design of the curriculum was posted on the government website and the new curriculum that's supposedly we'll see drafts of it soon is expected to align with this. And not surprisingly, uh, the framework document reflects a 19th century progress vision for education. Everything is imagined as extremely linear. It presents knowledge as hierarchical and comprised of isolated bits, focuses on memorization of facts, and on extreme standardization where all children in the same grade will learn the same things at the same time. And it also sets up a tension between science and religious beliefs. And here's one quote from it. The curriculum must be clear, concise, and as free as possible from ideology, pedagogy, and jargon. So in October, um, the draft social studies curriculum was leaked by somebody in the education department to Janet French, who is a reporter with CBC News in Edmonton. And she shares here a tweet with images from a page in the grade one document. And this was the curriculum that was to be implemented in the fall of 2009. The topic is conceptual understanding of land, including that land offers teachings, oral history, stories, and that land sustains everything, people, animals, plants, and communities, and that people have diverse ways of living with the land. All of these things are struck out, crossed off the document, and these sarcastic comments are inserted at the side. The following sounds like mysticism. And one could equally say water sustains everything or the fire of the sun or oxygen or the Holy Ghost. All would be true in their way. Now I know you probably, some of you, depending on your computer screen, can't see this uh, very clearly. But what it is is a page from the grade three, four curriculum document and the entire page is crossed off. So the essential understanding at the top was understanding the ideas and institutions of our systems of governance and their origins. It helps us to know our rights and responsibilities as citizens and enables communities to flourish. The learning objectives were about fairness and equity. These are also crossed off. And there is a comment written into the document by the reviewer or the advisor that I highlighted in pink. And he explains there that this table is deleted because there is already enough civics material in the section above. And he says equity is probably a politically partisan and charged buzzword. Equity sounds good, but there is more than one way to understand it. And then he comments equal outcomes in brackets utopia can only be obtained by force or by imposing injustice on other groups to help one group. So Matt Wolf, a Jason Kenney's um, issues manager who is paid close to $100,000 a year to harass citizens on Twitter, or we think that's his job description. Um, here he is reacting to the immediate critical response of the leaked documents uh, two days later. And notice that at the bottom here, he's citing an article by David Staples who I'm blocked from seeing his post. So David Staples says, Kenny should give the political left what it wants in education, social justice schools. And Matt Wolf comments and amplifies on this, school choice is a wonderful thing. And if people wanna have a social justice school, they should go ahead and create that. And he goes on to say, many of those experts in quotes, won't be content with allowing social justice charter schools. They don't want personal choice. They want the state to force their personal political views on your kids. So in the leaked documents, the reviewer wrote somewhere in there that the negative effects of the arrival of Europeans in Canada is, quote, too sad and upsetting, end quote, for fourth graders, and that students should learn about this in grade nine or high school. And also that lessons should cover residential schools within the broader context of what he calls, quote, harsh schooling. And so this is a comment uh, that he wrote into the document of how he thinks that residential schools and colonialism in Canada should be taught. The ugliness of Dickensian schooling, boarding schools, 19th century discipline methods, and residential schooling that apply to some Indigenous kids can probably be best saved for later 
when learners are more mature and less emotionally vulnerable to traumatic material. And CBC in Edmonton interviewed Senator Murray Sinclair, the former chair of the TRC, and he commented that the curriculum document, quote, deliberately misrepresents what teaching about residential schools was all about. It wasn't just about harsh schooling. And Dr. Carla Peck, social studies professor at the University of Alberta, described the curriculum as it is, this leaked document as, quote, repulsive, regressive, and grounded in racist ideology that positions white Western Christian knowledge as superior to any other knowledge. Dr. Dwayne Donald, Indigenous Curriculum Studies Professor at U of A, wrote in an article in the conversation that, quote, the leaked curriculum documents also frame references to Indigenous topics and themes in the past, as though we as Indigenous people don't exist in the present, incorporating course content that devalues and marginalizes the significance of Indigenous knowledges, experiences, and histories is an expression of racism and white supremacy. Uh, so uh, on November 17th, there was an Extinction Rebellion uh, action in Burnaby, BC, blocking the rail lines in an effort to uh, protest the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And so here's a tweet from the UCP Government Caucus now. And on the left-hand side, their little image shows a picture of the protest in Burnaby and on the right side, uh, talking again about how Extinction Rebellion radical people shouldn't be allowed in our classrooms. And so attempting again to make a connection between uh, these two events. And then another survey comes up and survey spelled wrong here. Uh, and so this survey, even though we now have Bill 1 passed into law that protests are illegal and that you can't do these things, they would like to know your opinion on this. And so here's another survey on the UCP Government Caucus website. And it refers again to Extinction Rebellion and uh, reminds everybody that similar protests also were held in Edmonton and it asks you to give all of your information again and then to donate some money. Adriana Lagrange again, uh, she kind of took a break from Twitter and speaking about education for a while after the social studies curriculum got leaked, but now she's back a month later and saying that uh, we've never had this level of transparency and accountability with the curriculum. And note again that she's quoting here uh, an article by David Staples in the Edmonton Journal. And so they go on to say, well, that's the UCP this actually was, yes, the UCP caucus tweeting it. Sorry, push the wrong button. This is the UCP tweeting this. So this is the UCP party is retweeting what she said. And so these things are being tweeted and amplified by multiple MLAs, multiple groups, the party, the caucus website, and the ministers. And so this is how it's going to be transparent. They again quote the Edmonton Journal, David Staples, talking about transparency and accountability. So these words are repeated over and over and over. And how will we do this? We'll know the name of every single of one of the hundreds of teachers. And so here we have finally um, the slide again. We've seen this one before. It's an image from the Canadian Energy Center website. And I thought about this slide for a long time and the way that it shows the iconic Alberta blue sky. It's a very sunny place here. And this field of canola, which is a monocultural crop that covers a lot of the prairies that requires a lot of herbicides, chemical fertilizers and massive fossil fuel infrastructure. And then the oil pump jack uh, in the background of this field. And I feel this slide represents the curriculum revisions that are happening here. The framework suggesting that all children in the same grade across the entire province will learn the same thing at the same time is a highly standardized or monocultural model of education. There's nothing innovative, new or forward thinking in the framework document. There's nothing in it that suggests that children who are learning in schools are living in a time of ecological crisis and all of its unjust and unequally distributed sufferings for humans and other creatures caused by precisely what is depicted in this image. And so where does this leave us here in Alberta? And I wonder what is a curriculum 
for the aftermath of the petro state and it will have an after and it's coming soon and what will this transition be like and what is the role of education and curriculum in that transition and how can teachers and curriculum respond to the petro masculine toxic authoritarian violence the, dis the dismissive attempts for teachers and for expertise the attempt to crush dissent whether that be actual protests or views in classrooms other than the ones that this government wants taught. And I think these are very concerning developments uh, for our community here. And this is my final slide. This is a presentation I wish I was giving, so I'll be giving this next time. <laughs> um, but those of you who know me know I can't get through a conversation without talking about bees. So these are the honeybees in my backyard. And this bee here on the left hand side is sitting on cilantro flowers. So this is zoomed up quite a lot. And there's a surprise here, which is on her hind leg here, her pollen basket. Cilantro pollen is pink. And that was a moment of wonder for me. And on the top right hand side, this is wax comb made from the body of the bees. And you can see the pink pollen stored in there. This is food for their babies coming from the environment uh, in the area around my home and the other colors of pollen here. And in the bottom right hand corner, that's the queen bee of this colony and her name is Greta. I'm putting you back on the screen. So thank you, that is the end of my presentation for now and uh, I'll open it up if anybody wants to have a conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Saito, for your very insightful and thought provoking talk. And uh, anybody have questions could uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask Dr. Saito questions. I do have a question. Um, sorry, I'll get my video on here. <laughs> Hi, I'm I'm Maria Van Valise. I'm a PhD uh, candidate at um, at OISE. I've been a longtime educator here in Ontario, and I'm researching uh, youth mental health and the pedagogies that can support youth mental health in the context of the climate emergency. Um, one of the things I'm wondering about is how do you see teachers resisting? Um, in, in the context that you've described. So what are some of the ways that teachers are actually um, challenging those discourses of, of the state? Yeah, this is an interesting question. I actually don't have the data for this, except for um, from my own classrooms in teacher education. So this is a research study I really do want to do and uh, have tried to get money for a few times and then now it's a pandemic. So. Um, not doing this kind of research, but I'm definitely going to collect some data on this. But I can say from uh, talking to teachers that even teachers who are uh, extremely creative and courageous in their practice find this incredibly difficult when I've talked to them. And uh, I can't really speak to their resistance, but they were, they did find this threatening to speak about the strikes when they were going on in Calgary and the people that I talked to said they did not raise it, but other teachers had children who left their class and went and so they had to address it. But I know from the students at the university that they, in my classes, they are very keen to address these issues and to know how they are going to take this up in their classrooms. It's very, um, I think it's very complicated and this will be interesting data to gather. I can say that in my interdisciplinary class this past year, we have a class where students work in groups and create huge interdisciplinary curriculum projects. Uh, almost 100% of the 36 students in the class working in their groups did a project related to something with climate crisis. And that was the first time that's happened. And I was really interested to see that those are the topics that they chose to work on. And this came up quite a bit in our classes about how um, they would do this. And I don't know if um, Sidra wants to speak. Sidra's here in, uh, Sidra, do you wanna talk about what happened to you? 
sorry, could you ask the question again? My audio is then cutting out a little bit. Oh, sure. I didn't know if you wanted to speak up about this, but you're one of the people that had an encounter um, at the interdisciplinary showcase around your project. So oh, I didn't yeah. want to share that story. Sure, I can share it. Um, we had been working on this project for several months and it was a combined group project about um, grade nine interdisciplinary project looking at human migration and climate change that's in, in impacting that. And it went through, you know, the science curriculum, uh, humanities and arts a little bit. And the, one of the first people I presented it to at this interdisciplinary showcase was the hiring manager for a Calgary school board who I knew previously from other work we had done together. And he barely listened to the actual outline of the project. He saw that climate change was in the title and said, how are you going to teach this in our classroom? How, like, what are you going to say to parents? I was like, say to parents about what? The, the research is right here. These are all the facts. This is the curriculum. Here's how it relates. What would I say to them other than I'm doing a really good job of teaching your kids an interdisciplinary project? And he was not into it. And his only concern the whole time was dealing with parents. And initially I was like, that's not, an appropriate response for someone who works in admin, you're supposed to protect your teachers, but I guess it was something that he had dealt with before. I could tell he was speaking from experience that he had had parents who were upset about this type of content in their kid's classroom. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer that question because I think, yeah, it's a, we're in a very challenging, complicated time with this. Mm -hmm. And I think the children, the climate striking children, that's why I'm very interested in what they're up to because they have discovered civil disobedience. They're walking out of school. Um, they know the door of the school is not locked. They will leave if uh, they're not happy with what's happening there. And it's been a lot quieter and slower here because there is, I think, a dismissive and threatening atmosphere about it in Alberta, but that's not true all over the world. And so I think young people are driving this change and I see it in the new teachers as well. And so it will be very interesting to see in Alberta the collision between this new curriculum document and what teachers are doing in their practice. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I, it'd be great to connect as well, just because I think there's a lot of obviously overlap. And if my own research is really yeah. looking at this and what, what it is that teachers are ultimately doing who are making these commitments and are, are allowing themselves to be really uh, like driven by the students like if we talk about centering student voice all the time well what does that actually mean right in this context yeah. yes yeah. I think so so it'll be really interesting do please connect with me yeah thank you I have a question about um like you mentioned civil disobedience and its importance in our in our history um I is I'm a teacher I was teaching in a school last year during the climate strike when it came to town and it was uh, really good and um, our school promoted it. It was a um, um, uh, wide effort. There was a grade eight group that went to um, um, went with a teacher downtown um, in Victoria and um, and also we sort of allowed students on their own to go downtown as a private school. So um, I was a bit, I'm, I'm wondering like in what ways did do some teachers take over the student initiated civil disobedience? Um, like if, if it's started by students, how can we make sure that students own it and, and not allow us old people? Because old people are guilty of the climate destruction in all our own little ways. How do we keep ourselves from co-opting or sh yeah. what, what's our line? I, th I think that the question should just sit here. Actually, this is really important. And I noticed this at the last climate strike um, in the fall here, just a few months ago in Calgary, um, versus that one that I showed the pictures of, which was extremely student-led. Like really, it was a little bit um, concerning, the lack of adults in that space, but in a way not. The kids were completely fine. And they almost had a die-in in the middle of the road. The police came and stopped them. And uh, we were, we listened to them announcing how this was going to be done and uh, we had a quick conversation and I said, well, I have to go lie down on the street in front of the cars. Like I'm not, as one of the only adults here, I'm putting my body between these vehicles and these children who are being so courageous. But uh, the police actually politely requested that the kids move the die-in up to the plaza and they politely did this. And so that was great laying in the plaza. 
with hundreds of young people quietly for seven minutes in the sun. But the last demonstration here, the climate one, was completely taken over by white older men. And Sidro is there too, so she can speak to that. But uh, they did the speeches, and there was a group of girls holding a climate sign, a Fridays for Future sign off to the side, and I was really surprised to see that. So I think your question is really interesting, especially in the context here. I've talked to my friends in other countries, and I think a lot of these remain very student-driven there, but also community-driven. So there's not a division there between the children and the adults. The adults are supporting the children, and they are trying to work for change together. And this kind of mutuality and uh, relationship building and not dividing children and adults seems like a better way forward to me, and not the way that we usually think about childhood. But uh, I think it's a unique situation here in Alberta where this is very suppressed. I know in a lot of places around the world, schools were closed in New York City, Montreal, my friend in Belgium, she said it was an unbelievable experience. The schools were closed, there were teachers and families and um, parents and children everywhere out on the streets. And uh, she said she's never witnessed anything like that in her life. And so this is not where we are here. Yeah, thanks Ian. It's an important question. And I love that, I have to say, I love the government of the Philippines in that letter saying that the children should be leading this and inviting them to and directing that. So I think that's very important that they said that and they recognize that this is a movement that they use, they're driving and that they are saying, you know, go for it. Yeah, thank you. I think I, I see Kathy Bigmore uh, raising the hand. Considering the time, I think we will accommodate one more question. So go ahead, Kathy. Oh, I hate to take anybody's one space. Thank you, Jackie. This is a super important topic. I'm, I'm trying to think about uh, curriculum theory. Forgive me for being that way. Uh, that is, what is this a case of? And I'm specifically thinking about this question of how is it that school curriculum and teaching can add value, uh, you know, even on all kinds of topics that are far less contentious. There's the difference between information, which is already emotional laden and partial in every sense out in the world, and, and then some kind of deeper understanding and capability and uh, opportunity to talk across differences that school maybe could provide. And this seems like a classic instance of that. And I wonder how you, you think beyond allying with the climate justice movement and breaking down barriers to the younger generation, how can curriculum add value to what kids already know better than their teachers? I don't, what's, I don't understand the last part of your question. How does it add value better than their teachers? In other words, uh, I hear you saying teachers should follow the brilliance of some of our activist students. Right. Oh, I don't know. I wasn't, what are we adding? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's not really what I was implying here. My interest is more in what the young people um, are doing and that they have discovered in this time, this kind of activism with schools. And they're asking, I think, in a very serious and genuine way for a different kind of relationship, different kinds of learning. And so to me, I think it's teacher's responsibility to answer this call, for me at least, and I speak for myself, and to really think hard about what schools are doing and how we are going to do this. And especially, I'm thinking about it in this Alberta context and what we have coming here with the curriculum that's coming here. And so I don't really think of it as teachers adding value. And I think that teachers will be able to uh, work with this curriculum that comes out because it's always an interpretive process, although we don't really know how it will be enforced, if it is really as um, sequenced as it says it's going to be, and if it comes with a lot of testing and becomes all just memorizing and learning facts. 
So I think this is a question that harkens back to the images of school that we have and the images of children, the images of the world, and the images of what learning is. And uh, they get pretty stuck in the imag cultural imagination. It's very hard to switch this to something else and imagine something else. Of course, many, many teachers, and including here in Calgary and Alberta, are brilliantly uh, living this out in different ways with their students. And uh, we see it all the time and we see it in our students' projects at the university. So I know this is a very poor answer uh, to your question. I don't know if I'm really understanding what your question is, but I'm not implying that we follow the students, but I am pretty sure that we're in a time that we need to find new kinds of community with each other and alliances and where adults don't have all the power over children and children have asserted some power here in their actions with the climate strikes. And that's what interests me about it is what have they learned. And also that if children are creating their own curriculum, so if we go to the, especially to the Australian kids um, during the first part, the first year of the climate strikes, they literally were creating their own curriculum. And so if this is happening, it's really, I feel a call to teachers and educators to pay attention to what's happening there. And they felt they weren't, well, on the one hand, they had learned a lot of this in school. So I felt quite proud of schools because the students knew a lot about governments and politics and policies and history and civil rights movements, and they were building on that. And so they were building on what they learned in school but then they were teaching each other and uh, holding all kinds of learning events for each other outside of the school space during their vacation and uh, inviting other kids and young people into these spaces. So this is, that's what fascinates me about this is we have on the one hand what the Alberta government is doing, a very top-down controlling curriculum. And then we have groups of young people and, you know, they're bubbling up and creating something else. And, uh, if these two things are going to come together, I think, in really interesting ways. But why, why, should they, why should they go to school? I think that's what they kind of figured it out. So this is an interesting moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Seidel. Um, Oh, I see in the chat, there is uh, one more question. I don't know whether you have time to accommodate one more question. I have time. If anybody wants to hang out and chat, I'd love to, so. <laughs> so maybe just one more question for Donut. Um, I think uh, there is some, um, so you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, Jackie. Um, what, what would you say you've learned from bees about curriculum and, um, and I guess how to respond to what's going on politically in Alberta that you laid out for us? Uh, yeah, so I guess not everybody knows this, but I started this beekeeping, bee tending hobby passion that is pretty much my favorite thing to do, but what have I learned? I would say the first thing is about a really a kind of embodiment, ecological embodiment. And so uh, when you're beekeeping, first of all, I learned that learning is hard. So beekeeping is super, super hard and I make tons of mistakes and there's a lot of things to learn and it's never ending. And um, so it's reminded me that uh, challenging learning is a good thing and it's difficult and takes a long, long time and that if I read everything about beekeeping in a book and studied it forever, if I tried to do it, I wouldn't be able to do it. And so my body learns to do it and my senses learn to do it. And so it relies on touching and smelling and hearing and your whole body being there and it's sticky and messy and dirty and it smells wonderful and bees smell and the honey smells and the whole colony smells and it makes a lot of noise but also that there are a lot of relationships there that are invisible to me. So I can see that pollen. I knew that pollen, the pink one came from that cilantro, but the rest of it, I don't know where they're going. I don't know what they're doing. Also, I can't control them. So beekeeping is highly industrialized. So this is a presentation for another time, but uh, 
those canola fields rely on bees because mass industrialized agriculture uh, is not good for most pollinators. And honeybees, on the other hand, not native and solitary bee species, but honeybees have a huge range and they're generalists. And so that's why they're used. And I use the word used on purpose uh, to pollinate these kind of crops that keep most of us alive. And um, you know, they're put in boxes and they get lined up in little rows in um, bee frames. And so like the parallels are so close between schools and what a hive looks like and the language is the same. It's all like about managing them. And, but you actually in the end can't really control them. You have to come to know them and every colony has its own personality and their way of organizing themselves and being in the world. So I think, you know, on the one hand, I've learned about honeybees being part of this industrial petrochemical world and they really are what I would call petrol bees now, especially the kind of mass beekeeping and Alberta has like some of the big, it's the fifth biggest honey producer in the world if we were a country. So we have beekeepers here that own tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of colonies and hives for agricultural pollination. And so there's that side to it. But then there's the other side that it's wild and and out it's out of my control and no matter how much time I spend there I can't fully ever know it and it's very very mysterious and so um, you have to approach them with a kind of awe and reverence and for their intelligence and uh, bees are completely not human in everything that they do. Uh, so they're, they're not that easy for us to understand with our human mind and just to be with them is like a huge honor for me. And so that's why I really like it is approaching the hive actually in the way that you could approach a child or approach a topic uh, with a kind of reverence and wonder and awe knowing that you never actually could know everything about it and you never can touch everything that it touches, but that everything is touching anyways. I guess, I don't know. So <laughs> it's the, the most embodied activity that I have ever done. So it, it consumes every, when you're doing beekeeping, if anybody wants to come visit, let me know. But uh, there's nothing else in the world around you in that moment that you're with bees. It's only just being with the bees and with all of, of your senses and what you know about them. And that's a very interesting experience. And I wish that for children in their learning in schools, that kind of immersion in something that is so big and so wonderful and that's life sustaining. Um, I think on, on the beautiful and touching note of the beekeeping, so I'm in the interest of the time. So I, I would like to conclude today's session. I hope to thank Dr. Jackie Seidel again for your very thought provoking talk and our engaging conversations we have today. And I hope to thank Dr. William Pinar and Dr. Anne Thelen for hosting this seminar series. And um, thank you again for participating in today's session and which is the last session for 2020 and the registration for the 2021 seminar series is now open. So you, you are welcome to register yourself on our website event page. And, um, and our next session is scheduled on January 22nd, 2021. And I hope everyone uh, uh, a great and uh, joyful and safe holiday season and uh, hope to see you uh, soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.